السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, let's continue from where we left off last day in uh, surah 7 verse 25 questions uh, were raised in other words the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was ordered by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say certain things to those people who always went against him those who challenged him those who were denying the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one God, one Allah, and those who uh, went against him and challenged him and denied his nabuwat and prophethood. So based on what they believed in and what they thought was the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in different verses of the Holy Quran mentioned to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to challenge them, ask them to bring forth their uh, the truth of what they believe in. So therefore, if we go back in Surah Saba in verse 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Prophet, say to them, ask them the question, who gives you provision from the heavens and the earth? If you believe in another person besides Allah, and you believe that there is no Allah, and you believe in these images and carved the objects you have, answer the question, you are worshipping these things, but who gives you provision from the heavens and the earth? Who gives you food to eat? Who sends water in the sky? And then after that, obviously they couldn't answer. Then the Prophet ﷺ was ordered by Allah to tell them that it is Allah, and you know it is Allah. So if you know it is Allah, then, and you are not worshipping Allah, then you are in plain error. And then the Prophet ﷺ was also ordered <coughs> to say to them, that you will not be asked about our sins, nor shall we be asked about what you do. In other words, do not, it's plainly telling them, do not waste your time in looking after what we do. And every moment, you see, every moment, <laughs> subhanAllah, the, the mushrikeen, at that time, they were always finding out. They were always digging in. They were always spying on the Muslim. They were always looking to see what new Muhammad was saying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What new law has been revealed? What is he saying about us? What is he doing? And they were always looking to actually put down the Prophet wasallam and make up fabricated tales and all these different things to show that the Prophet wasallam was not upon the truth. So they were actually wasting away their whole lives, not thinking and worrying and being concerned about what they did and what will be their plight on the day of judgment, but their main worry and concern was about what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims did. So therefore, at the end of their life, when they didn't focus on their own self, they would have wasted their lives. When a person behaves in this manner that you are always worried and concerned about the other person, then what time do you have to worry about your own self? And this is how shaitan deceives people. He makes them preoccupied with other people and they forget their own selves. So they are not preparing their own selves for the hereafter. They are not concerned about the matters with respect to them and Allah on the day of judgment, but they are always worried about. So this is why the Prophet wasallam was ordered by Allah, say to them, you wouldn't be questioned about us, so don't worry about us. Do not make us your worries. Do not let us uh, be the reason for you be, being preoccupied with other things beside your own self. You would be questioned about your own self, so you think about your own selves. As for us, then we will answer for our own deeds on the Day of Judgment. So do not worry about us. Do not waste time on, 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 on thinking about us, etc. This is why you will find it's a follow-up to that now in verse 26. The uh, Surah Saba, that's the verse that is mentioned at the top of the page there, which you have been given. Say, that is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is ordered by Allah to say to them, Our Lord will assemble us all together. <clears throat> so in this world, whatever we do, you are telling us we are wrong and you are right. And we are saying that you are wrong and you are not doing the correct thing. So, on the day of judgment, Allah will gather all of us, subhanAllah. Allah will gather us, Allah will gather you, 
and then he will judge between us with truth bilhaq with the truth so you will be there we will be there and then allah will make a judgment and he allah will not err in his judgment and he would not make a mistake in his judgment and he will not be confused in his judgment he will make the correct judgment because he is the most most trustworthy all-knowing judge he is such a judge who knows everything subhanallah normally if a judge is making a mistake is because he doesn't know something two people stand trial before a judge and there is a claim for one and there is a claim for the other one and the judge sees this person to be upon the truth so he gives in favor of this person because he doesn't really know everything about this person only what is presented what is not presented the judge will know about that so many a time a judge who is just how much can he know if, if you go to court lawyers present your case how much can he really know exact you know i mean when there is one against another person one person against another person it's only their words they have no evidences they have no witnesses is one against one as we say it is who can argue the best the best he might win the case he's good at arguing you know he can really he's eloquent in his speech so he can win it so therefore a judge can make a mistake because he doesn't know the truth he doesn't know further than what he hears he doesn't know further than what he can see but allah who has all knowledge and knows every single thing he cannot make an error and will not make an error this is why subhanallah we are fortunate that the law we have in our deen is a divine law given by the one who knows what will happen now what will happen in a thousand years from now what will happen until the day of judgment he knows the hearts of men he knows the inclination that the hearts will go in he knows how people will think he knows the weaknesses of men he knows the satanic temptations that can come to men and with all that complete and full knowledge allah has he has given us a law that is best suited for our own selves so it's not a law that is based on the fact that it falls deficient because it doesn't match the times allah already knew this time before he came it is not a law that will not be able to suit any country or place because allah know which country will be developed at what point in time in the history of man he has given us a law that will never be outdated because this law will remain until the day of judgment so it is the supreme law not made from the minds of human beings who are prone to errors and mistakes but it's coming from al hakim the wise one al hakim the judge the one who is most trustworthy in everything he sees and everything that he has revealed so this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referred to as the most trustworthy all knowing judge he knows every single thing and he will not err and make a mistake in his judgment so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was ordered by allah to tell them that with all the arguments and with all the things you say against us on the day of judgment allah will gather you allah will gather us and he will make that judgment we'll see then if you can't see now we will see then who was right and who was wrong they are informed that in the hereafter on the day of judgment allah the lord of mankind shall gather everyone from among the believers and unbelievers and will judge each person with fairness and justice allah will do that now it is wrong for us at times you know sometimes even among us as muslims that there is a dispute over something and uh, what is correct is clearly it is clearly uh, manifest it's manifest it is clear in the eyes of everybody that this is the correct thing but yet people because of the fact that they may personally see that in a different way and in different light from their own selves that is what they are thinking based on their own thoughts they still 
argue about it. They have a contention about it. And, and even though you are trying to put across the correct thing, they say, listen, Allah will judge us on the day of judgment. So they use it wrongly. They use it wrongly. You know, some Muslims develop, you know, that ayah in Surah Al-Kafirun, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَالْيَدِينَ to you belong your religion and to us some Muslims use that against each other that is totally wrong that ayah was revealed when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was arguing with the unbelievers and they just wouldn't listen and they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they tried to compromise they tried to make him compromise he said, oh Muhammad let's live in peace and harmony so what's the way out you worship our gods for one year and then in turn, for the other year, we will worship your God. So we will take from each other and we will be pleasing each other. So you will worship our God for one year and then the other year, we will worship your gods here and there. We will mix and we will compromise in our, our way. In that way, we will live happy. We will live in harmony. You wouldn't blame us. We wouldn't blame you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kul, O Muhammad, the Prophet, Allah is saying, Kul say, say to them, O Muhammad, Ayyuhal kafirun, O unbelievers. I, I will not worship what you worship. I will not worship. I will never worship. I am not doing it now and I will never do it in future. So when I have my way and you have your way, so you go on your way and I will go on my way. So verses of this need here, they were revealed to be used against those people who are not Muslims, those people who are unbelievers, those people who are polytheists, and they are arguing, and they want you to follow their way. Okay? But when Allah has revealed his deen, then the truth is in the deen of Allah. The halal is what Allah has made halal, the haram is what Allah has made haram. So the truth is in the deen of Allah. So it is wrong for a person to stand upon his own desires. And another one who is standing upon the teachings that came from Allah. So by giving us the teachings, Allah has already judged certain things. So his judgment is here. His judgment about what should be called right and what should be called wrong is already here. This is what he has given us in the form of his deen, his religion. So therefore, it is wrong now for a person to argue against the true teachings of Allah's religion and yet say to a Muslim or the Muslim or an alim or scholar on the day of judgment, Allah will judge between us. Well, Allah has judged already and based on what Allah has judged, he, he, he is saying you are wrong. This is, the, this is the understanding of our deen. That our deen tells us what is right and what is wrong and this is why we hold on to it. So anything besides that will be deemed to be wrong because Allah has revealed the true teachings in the deen, in his religion. So what the Quran says, this is correct. What Allah wants in the Quran is what Allah has judged to be right and to be his commandments. Anything that opposes that, it will be called wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent his Nabi, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the correct teachings. Those who oppose him in his teachings, and they go against his ways and his teachings, they are known to be wrong. So nobody could come with teachings that are outside Islam, and put it up with arguments from their own selves, and then say, this is your opinion, this is my opinion, Allah will judge between us on the day of judgment. But Allah has already judged on the matter. So whatever is known to be wrong here will also be wrong there. So it's not that you are wrong here and you are right there. But, so therefore that is something that we have to be careful of and we have to be aware of statements that are supposed to be used against those people who are following different ways and paths that are based on falsehood. This is about them and for them, not for Muslims who are following the deen of Allah and supposed to be following the deen of Allah. He, Allah, is the most, he is the just judge who will not be unjust and oppressive to anyone. Subhanallah. Allah will never be unjust to anyone. 
Allah will not be oppressive to anyone. He is the all knower. He knows every single thing. Allahu Akbar. Who is fully aware of all the actions of his servants. He will therefore give each his due share. So on the face of the earth, whatever a man did, and it was not recognized by other people, Allah will recognize that on the day of judgment and give him what belongs to him. He will give him his due share. Whatever he has worked for, he will get that. Those who have been truthful and held on to the path of truth shall be rewarded with paradise, subhanallah. And those who rejected the truth and followed falsehood shall be requited with the fire of hell. Each shall reap the consequences of his actions. So Allah will not be unjust. So on the face of the earth, on one side you will see a poor Muslim, a believer, taking our, times, our minds back to the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or even at our times, during the, the history of human beings, Muslims will be oppressed by other people. They will be poor. They will be living in such a way that everybody will look down upon them. So they have no status and significance in the eyes of people. Opposite to them, those people who have everything deny, deny Allah. So those who deny Allah and have everything, they consider themselves to be higher. They consider themselves to be on top. And as for these poor slaves of Allah, they believe in Allah, they are true believers, but they are really nothing. Allah is just. Allah will recognize the good of everybody. So on the day of judgment, this man will appear and this person will appear. And those who believe in Allah will be granted paradise and given his due share. It's not about who you were and what you were looked at on the face of the earth. You will get your due share in the hereafter. Allah will give you paradise because you recognize the good things that the man did. And as for those who consider themselves to be lofty and high and proud and arrogant and above other, others, they lived with falsehood, on falsehood, and they carried falsehood throughout their lives. On the day of judgment, Allah will give them their due share and their share will be the fire of hell for disbelieving in Allah. So every single thing Allah knows and everybody will be dealt with in a fair and just manner on the day of judgment. Surah Saba goes further in verse 27 and it states, Say, O Muhammad, to these polytheists and pagans, show me those whom you have joined to him as partners. Show me. Subhanallah. It's an open challenge now. You know, people can say anything they want. But the beautiful thing about our deen, remember, whatever is based on truth will always give the challenge. And it will never be afraid because it has the proof. It has the proof, you know. If you are on the right, you, you will always give the challenge. Prove me wrong, you will say. Because you know you are on the right. If you are truthful, you will tell a man, prove that I'm lying if you can. Because you know you are truthful. So you can give the challenge. But if you know you are lying, you wouldn't say that. Because you know you are lying, a person can catch you. If you know you are on falsehood, you wouldn't tell anybody, prove me false, because you know. <laughs> It's just that you were hoping the man wouldn't find a fault in you and pick it up. But anytime you're on the haq, you, you will always give the challenge. This is why Islam throughout the Quran has always given the challenge to the whole mankind. Such a challenge that when they said that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made up the Quran, Allah says, okay, accept this challenge. If you say Muhammad made up the Quran, he is a human being, he was a human being, then you all the human beings on the face of the earth, together with all the jinns on the face of the earth, make up a short verse of a Quran. Not a whole surah. Allah says, we are not asking you to make up the whole Quran. Not even a surah, just one short verse. And you bring it up and see if it can match the Quran. But until today, Allahu Akbar. Nobody had done it. Nobody has done it. And it will never be able to be done because the Quran is. The words of Allah, not from the human mind and the human heart. Further than that, Allah put another challenge. If you think that this Quran is coming from any other person besides Allah, you find faults in it. Pick out errors. Do you think anybody can really? I mean, just imagine. If any man writes a book now, do you think he can give a challenge like that? Pick out a fault? Sure. Everybody, they think differently. The time may change, so he said this word is not used properly, this word is outdated. 
This word is not the best word to be used here. The grammar is a bit in and out. You know, somebody will surely. Who else but Allah can give such a challenge? Find one fault in the Quran and come up. And say it is a fault if you are truthful. But nobody has done it. And until today, alhamdulillah, nobody. And nobody will be able to do it. Nobody will be able to do it. Subhanallah. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, oh Muhammad, tell them. If what you believe in is the truth, then show me those whom you have joined as partners. Where they are, show me, bring them. Bring them forward. It's like, I would like to meet them also. I would like to see them, speak to them. Bring them forward. Nay, then Allah says, nay. There are not at all any partners with Allah. There are no partners with Allah. So they can't provide anything. Because the things they call to be associates with Allah, they do not exist. They are not around. They are no partners with Allah. So Allah says there are no partners for him. But he is Allah all alone, the almighty, the all wise. Here in a rebuking manner. So it was not really telling them to bring it. It was rebuking them. It was telling them that you people are lying. You are making up a lot of things. You have no one to worship. And there is no partner for Allah. So if you have, bring them, let me see them. But it's like indirectly telling them, you don't have anyone. There are no partners to Allah and for Allah. He directs them to provide. So here in a rebuking manner, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been asked to challenge the polytheists and summon them to prove the truth of what they believe in. What you are saying. What you are believing. That you have this lat and uzza and manat and you have this one who can do this. Where these things are, bring them. Bring them forward. Let's see what they have. Let's see what's their reality. He directs them to provide him with solid proofs. Not only statement. Not anybody can say anything. But what's the basis for that statement? What is that statement founded on? Where is the proof? So he directs them to provide him with solid proofs. To show him and to prove to him the reality, existence, and truth of the idols and images that they have taken as partners with Allah. Prove that to me. Where these things are? Do they really exist? What can they do? He demands that they explain what share the idols have in the creation of Allah. In other words, O oh, polytheists and mushrikeen, you tell me what did these things create? So we have the whole creation here. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was the situation. He said, in the Quran, Allah tells me he created the heavens, he created the earth, he created the human beings, he created the jinnats, he created the animals, the trees, vegetation. That's what Allah has created. You tell me what your gods have created now. Tell me. Can you pinpoint anything? Obviously, what can they pinpoint? Because their God doesn't exist, so they didn't create anything. So what can they provide? There is no proof. What help is asked the land? What help do they give to Allah? In the past or right now, Allah is Al Qahar. Allah is Al Jabbar, the compeller. Allah is the governor. And that's the aqidah and belief of every Muslim. Allah alone is the governor. If you say that there are others besides Allah, tell us what help are these things given to Allah? What has Allah pointed them over? The sun, the moon, the stars? Where? Where do they exist? If these names exist, where do they exist? What is their reality if these questions cannot be answered? And these idols have not created anything, then why should they be worshipped? Subhanallah. It's a straightforward thing. You, you know, it's like he's telling them, you can't even prove that these things exist at all. You can't say what they created if they created anything. You can't say what they are doing now and how they are helping Allah. So there is no existence of these things you are worshipping at all. So why worship things that non, are non-existent? Non-existent. Why? Just names concocted and fabricated names. Obviously, the polytheists could not give an answer to any of these questions. And so, in order to prevent them from such beliefs and stop them right there and show that they are upon falsehood, the Prophet ﷺ, in a reprimanding manner, said, Nay, no way. 
It can happen. You can have partners with Allah. Your images and your names that you call do not exist at all. So nay, but He is Allah. Only one Allah. Only one God. He is the Almighty, the All-Wise. It means that the issue is not as the polytheist said. It's not like what they are saying. It can never be like that. Instead, Allah is one who has no partners. He is the subduer, the vanquisher, dominator, and master of all affairs. Every single thing is under Him. He is the controller, they are control. He is the khalik, the creator. They are the makhluk, the created one. He moves them in whatever direction. He is the subduer and they are subdued by Allah's power. So there can't be anybody equal to Allah. He is all wise in his plans for his creation. In every single thing he does, it is filled with wisdom because every plan he has made for the entire creation, it is a wise plan. And they are wise plans. Everything. The shape of a human being, what a human being will eat, the, you know, I mean, the lifespan of a human being, you know, the, hu the jinnats being a separate makhluk, how do they exist? What is their duty? What are their duties? What are our duties? Every single decree Allah has made for us and for every one of his makhluk, it is filled with wisdom. We can't understand that. And sometimes we find ourselves questioning certain things, but we can't understand. What we have to understand and believe is that these things are being done by Al-Hakim, the one who is the most wise one. And the one who is the most wise one, the one who is Al-Hakim, all his actions are filled with hikmah and wisdom. It is not free from wisdom. Therefore, there is no partner and associate for him in his entire kingdom. Having dealt with the oneness of Allah in the previous verses, Surah Saba continues in verse 28 to speak about the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The verse states, that's 28, and we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a giver of glad tidings and a warner to all mankind, but most of men know not. O Prophet Muhammad, we have sent you as a giver of glad tidings. We have sent you as a warner, but not to a tribe or your family or not to the Arabs. We have sent you to the whole mankind, the universality of the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that this meteor of Nabuwat given to him was maqsus and specific only to him. No other prophet from the time of Adam alayhi salam until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, no other prophet was made a universal prophet. Subhanallah. The only prophet that came to the whole mankind for all times. Not only that, the only Nabi who was sent to men and jinn as a Nabi and as a Rasul. And every single person who dies or who's going to die after he came and who witnessed him and knew about him and heard about him, whether a Muslim or not Muslim, they will be asked about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the grave. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's message is universal and he is the Nabi for the whole mankind. Before him, all the other prophets were sent to selected tribes, selected territories and cities. And this Nabi was fixed for here. The people there will believe in him. And another prophet was fixed for this place. The people over there will believe in him. And that's how they lived. They are not, they are not going to be accountable to Allah for having not believed in another prophet who probably existed at the same time but in a different territory. And there were a few prophets existing at one time in different places. They will not be. They will be accountable to Allah with respect to whether they follow that Nabi who was sent to them or not. But everybody will be questioned about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he was sent to the whole mankind. 
And he was sent with two duties. One, it is to give glad tidings for those who believe and do good deeds, they will get paradise. And he was sent to be Nadir, a warner. He's Bashir and Nadir, a warner. To warn man, the whole of mankind, that if they do wrong and they disobey Allah, then the punishment of Allah awaits them in the hereafter. So both things must go hand in hand. And that's the job and the nature of the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That on one hand, you will tell people about doing good things and promise them good rewards, but you will also have to tell them if they do wrong things, they're going to be punished. Both ways. Basharat and Indhar, giving glad tidings and also warning people. Here, the verse makes it clear that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was certainly a messenger of Allah. That's the first thing. And that he was not sent only to the Arabs. Instead, he was sent to the entire mankind as a bringer of good news to the believers that they will be granted paradise and the pleasure of Allah for their true faith and good deeds and as a warner to the unbelievers of the punishment in the hellfire. So he was a Bashir and a Nadir in this way. However, as the verse states, most of the people do not know this. They do not know that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent to the entire mankind, and that he was a bearer of glad tidings and a warner to people. Most of the people do not know that. Even at his time, the people from among the Ahlul Kitab, the people of the Scriptures, they believed that he was sent only to the Arabs. So some of them accepted him as a true prophet. They accepted him as a true prophet. They came to him for judgment. They came to him to find out about teachings in their scriptures. They asked him questions because they knew he was a true prophet, but they did not accept him to follow him because they believed he was sent to the Arabs. Not to them, not to all mankind. For them, they believe Jesus came to them. And for the other section, they believe Moses came to them. So the Arabs never had anybody. Now the Arabs have somebody. So Allah to clear that up. Allah says, no, it's not like that. Rasulullah has been sent to you also. O oh, Jews and Christians and everybody else. He was sent to everybody. And his mission has abrogated the message of Musa salam, and Isa salam. After his coming, judgment will be given from the Qur'an alone. Teachings will come from the Qur'an alone. So, although he was sent to the whole of mankind, Allah himself says, but most people do not know that, that he was sent to the whole of mankind. And most people do not know and believe that he was sent as a bearer of glad tidings and as a warner. They also do not know of the rewards and punishments that are with Allah. Hence, so they do not know that the Prophet was sent to them from among the unbelievers because they did not accept him as a universal prophet. They also did not believe that he was a, a, a bearer of glad tidings who actually told them the good things. They thought that he was telling them bad things. And they also did not believe and know that he was actually warning them of the fire of hell, they thought he was making up stories. And the rewards and punishments that he announced to them from Allah, they thought that these things wouldn't happen at all. So on account of their ignorance and jahala, you see that word that Allah says, but most of men do not know, it is on account of that jahala and ignorance they denied Allah and disbelieved in the Prophet This is why Allah mentioned that. He sent the messenger as this, but most people do not know he is like that. So they took jahalat, ignorance, and that ignorance guided them to misguidance. That is how it happened. So as it's mentioned here, hence on account of their ignorance. Do, but this ignorance was not a natural ignorance. Sometimes naturally you may not know something. Many of us, there are many things we do not know. But once we have a thirst for the truth, we will find out and we will know. So that jahalat and ignorance, it's moved away because of our talab and thirst and because we want to seek the truth. But then some people, they do not know something and they will remain like that because they are very obstinate. They are stubborn. 
and they will remain firm upon their jahalat and ignorance, thinking that what, what they know, although they do not know, is sufficient for them. But they really don't know. So there are some people who do not know a thing, but they do not know that they do not know it. So they remain right there on that jahalat. Because if you know you don't know something, you're going to search for it, isn't that so? But if you don't know, you don't know something, how, cool, how will you find out? You will always think you know. So this jahalat led them to that misguidance. And the jahalat, it continued to be with them. Jahalat here means ignorance on account of their own behavior. The hate, the animosity they had against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they remained just like that. So, hence, on account of their ignorance due to their obstinate behavior, they have adopted the path of misguidance and deviation based on the crookedness of their hearts. They mocked the Prophet ﷺ and the believers in an attempt to show their dislike for Islam. So, one leads to the others. If you look at it, their ignorance, they remain like that because of their behavior. And their behavior made them believe that they were on haq, they were on the truth, and the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on falsehood. So they tried everything to deter the common people from following him, and they started to make a mockery of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in this regard, what they said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, and they say, when is this promise if you are truthful? So they will come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and say, oh Muhammad, you are telling us about this punishment will come, and this punishment will come. Would this ever come? Where will it come? When? Where is it? Tell us where is it? When will it come? Mocking him. Not that they really wanted to be punished. Who will want to be punished? They were just mocking him. So that is, they said mockingly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the believers, tell us if you are indeed truthful in what you say. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Bashir and Nadir. So he will always tell the believers, if you believe in Allah, you will go to paradise. But if you don't believe, you will be punished. So they will come and bold, they will say, but we didn't believe, so where is the punishment? No punishment is coming to us. If you are truthful, tell us when is this punishment coming? So they will say, if you are truthful in what you say, when will this punishment come which you have scared us about? You are warning us, you are scaring us, you are frightening us, O oh Muhammad. Where is the punishment? In response to them, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ordered by Allah to answer them in the following words. Say, O Muhammad, the appointment to you is for a day which you cannot but put back for an hour or a moment nor put forward. Subhanallah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is ordered to tell them that punishment is fixed already. You don't worry about that. That is going to come to you. You should not be worried. And when it comes then there will be no putting back. You will not be able to evade it, nor your begging will stop it from coming to you. It will come on its time, it will not come before its time. So even though you are threatening, and you are demanding that I show you, and demanding that I bring it to you to prove my truthfulness, I can't do that. Because when Allah has fixed the thing to happen, it happens only on its time. So even if I am to appeal to Allah, oh Allah, bring it forward, Allah has fixed it already and it will come only on its time. And if it's coming and then you begin to believe and, and beg Allah to remove it, it's going to come and hit you right there. It has a fixed time and an appointed time. It means that, oh polytheist, your time of punishment is already fixed. Even before you started to ask for it, that was already fixed. It will come to you at that moment which Allah has fixed for it. Whatever time Allah has fixed, it will come. It shall not be delayed based upon the pleading of anyone. So if it starts and people begin to plead with Allah, Oh Allah, not now, not now. We're going to believe and follow your message. It's not going to be delayed. Nor shall it be ad advanced upon the wish and desire of anyone like their wishes. They want to see it come immediately. It will not be advanced. Therefore, the message to them is, do not hasten the punishment. Do not, do not hurry it up then. Do not make it come before its time, for indeed, it shall come on its appointed time. It will come. Once, once Allah has fixed it to come, it will come and there will be no moving away of that. 
having mentioned this, Allah goes further to mention the extent of the persistence of the polite polytheists in their pig-headedness and rejection of the truth. To show you to what extent they will go to just condemn the truth. To openly deny it and say clearly with their mouth. You know, sometimes a person doesn't want to believe in something, but you are you're using many different statements. Not You say, well, not now. You know, sometime in the future I will listen. You know, I don't have to let time to listen to you now. You know, or you may find an objection in it. You know, like how many of them found the objection in, in what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was saying, that if he was saying something to them, they may pinpoint some fault and say, but if you are saying this, then, you know. But, you see, in, in a case like that, people will use different approaches to send a message to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet of Allah, that they won't, they won't believe in him. But those who outrightly are saying, we don't believe and we don't want to believe. I mean, that goes to show the extent to which they are deep into that confrontation. For them to actually openly say, it goes to show their pig-headedness and how they are, really their, their hearts are irrelevant, they are bent and they are crooked. So Allah says, speaks about such people and says, and those who disbelieve say, we believe not in this Quran, not, nor in that which was before it. So they came openly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were not hiding behind words like they were open unbelievers oh Muhammad this Quran we don't believe in that and besides that all those other scriptures that you are speaking about we don't believe in those scriptures at all subhanallah Allah says to the Prophet oh Muhammad oh Prophet but if you could only see when the holy moon the polytheists and wrongdoers if you could only see them when they will be made to stand before their Lord, how they will cast the blaming word one to another. If you could only see them when they are standing before Allah on the day of judgment, you will know the terrible plight and the horrible state of these people. If only you could see them and you can see through what they are saying and picture in your mind what will be their miserable plight on the day of judgment. And at that time, they will be blaming one another. All of them are in the same category, but they will be throwing blame on one another. Those who are deemed weak will say to those who are arrogant, their leaders, had it not been for you, we should certainly have been believers. So therefore, you always, wherever you go, there are always two categories of people, the followers and the followed ones. The followers and the followed ones. Wherever you go, you will always have people calling towards something. Whether it is goodness or whether it is bad in the whole world. And even at the time of the Prophet, wasalam, they call towards the truth and the wrongdoers call towards followers. They had followers, the wrongdoers had followers also. So even in this world today, Anytime you see people, they are following a trend. There will always be somebody calling towards that. It can be the environment, it can be the society, it can be the media. You know, it can be one man who is thinking this way. It can be one culture that is presenting itself to the whole of people that this is the way we do things. And then the, that culture begins to get followers. So wherever you have, you will always have these two groups. The followers, people who are following others and they want to do what others want them to do or they want to do what others like to do or they are listening and the ones who are followed. The ones who are followed. So on the day of judgment, these two categories of people and groups will quarrel with each other. On one hand, those who are followers will say, you were the ones who misguided us. We followed you. And the followed ones who are the leaders will say, no, 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 don't blame us. We didn't tell you to do what you did. It's your own self. Blame your own self. So every era of, you know, people, let's so to say, will always have these two categories. And just as this is mentioned here, it will happen to every such person. One, the person who did something, the person who did something, and then it happened to be wrong, he will look to put blame on somebody. He will look to put the blame on somebody. So, so to these people will be saying this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will be directing it to those people whom they followed. 
here, they said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first part of the ayah, that they will never testify to the truthfulness of the Quran and the previous revealed scriptures, nor would they believe in this. They wouldn't believe that it's a truthful thing. They wouldn't believe that it has uh, the message coming from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. They wouldn't believe in it at all. The Quran and all the other scriptures. In response to what they said, which depicted their disbelief and enmity to the religion of truth. So in their statement, you could see the extent of their rejection to the truth. In the very statement for them to come openly and say to the Prophet, we don't believe in this Quran at all. It tells you of the nature of their disbelief. How deep their kufr is. So, in response to what they said, Allah presented in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the dreadful state of these rejectors on the day of judgment. So that they, the unbelievers would know that though their mockery and rejection in this world seemed pleasing to them, it will bring severe destruction in the hereafter. You know why people do the wrong things they do? It's because it's exciting and enjoying to them. Just as what they said. It was pleasing to them. They were happy to say this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were happy to come and challenge the Prophet. They were happy to come and ridicule the Prophet. They felt they used to smile and laugh with each other when they uttered such statement. So they feel that they were being big when they said, we, we're not going to believe in what you, what you have brought. And then every time when, when Batil, it tries to condemn Al-Haq, the truth, then the bearers of battle always feel that they are better. And they feel happy about what they are doing. And they, are feel, they feel, you know, a sense of pleasure in putting down religion and religious beliefs. Thinking to themselves that they are the what advocates for a new time, for a new season, for a new trend, for a new culture, for something new that people will accept. They feel good about it. So what does the eye say? Though it may seem pleasing to you here, when you stand there, you will see the consequences of that. If only you knew, and only if a person knows, the consequences of his evil actions, he will not do it at all. That, will, that is what the Prophet wasallam, you know, was told by Allah, and this was revealed to the Prophet wasallam, to tell them, Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam But if you could see when the polytheists and wrongdoers will be made to stand before their Lord how they will cast blame on one another Here Allah presents a scene of what will happen on the day of judgment to the unbelievers and polytheists Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if he could only see the estate on the day, he will know that it will be a terrible and horrendous sight. It will be a dreadful day for the wrongdoers, but they don't know that. And they also don't want to know that. They are just dismissing everything. On that day, when the unbelievers witness the horrible punishment that awaits them when they will actually see that, they will begin to put the blame of their misguidance on others. When a person, you know, when you read the passages of the Quran, when people begin to see the blazing fire of hell and the severe punishment, immediately they will look for someone to put the blame on. They will look for someone. Why do you think in the Holy Quran Allah spoke about the, the, the issue about the day when the when the father will run away from his children and the children will run away from the father and the man will run away from the mother and the, the father will run away from the, you know, the, 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 the son and the daughter, you know, as it is mentioned there in the Holy Quran. And a day when one will not be able. It's so because of the fact that every person will be looking to put a blame on the other one. Somehow the son will catch the hand of the father and say, Allah, it's him. He didn't teach me that which is right. He grew me up and gave me everything, but he didn't teach me how to worship you. He didn't teach me the, the correct knowledge of Islam. 
On the opposite, the father will say, Oh Allah, my son knew what was right and he never stopped me from doing what was wrong. He saw me doing the wrong thing and never stopped me. And the mother and the wife and the daughter, everybody will be trying to lay blame on another. That's when they see that punishment because nobody will want to be thrown into that fire of hell. So they will be looking for a way out. And the easiest way out is say, Allah, don't blame me. I used to want to do that which is good, but this is the person who misguided me. These are the people, oh Allah, blame them and punish them. This is what people will be saying. So they will rebuke and criticize each other. Even though they were friends in this world. So even though, subhanallah, Allah himself says in the Quran that on the day of judgment, the closest of friends will become the bitterest of enemies. Because as I said, nobody will want to pay for another one and every person will be looking to lay the blame on another one. In that state, those who were weak and were followers of others will say to those whom they followed that had they not misguided them, they would have been guided and would have been believers. They will say to their leaders, it's because of you. If you didn't misguide us, we would have followed the truth. But you are the ones who misguided us. The weak and oppressed ones will thus blame their leaders for their disbelief and misguidance, which they followed on the face of the earth. With this, the leaders will then respond and absolve themselves from the blame which will be placed on them. About this, verse 32 of Surah Naba states, And those who were arrogant and they were the leaders, they will say to those who are deemed weak, those who are making that place in the blame, the leaders will now say to the followers, did we keep you back from guidance after it had come to you? Didn't you hear the prophet saying so and so? Did, did you not listen to the revelation of, of Allah? Did we stop you? The guidance came to you, but did we stop you? Nay, but you were mujrimun, you were polytheists, sinners, criminals, disobedient to Allah. You did that on your own. We didn't have we didn't do anything to you. We didn't stop you from following the truth. Here those who were followed and were looked upon by the weak ones will deny the statement made by their followers and will say to them in a rebuking manner. In other words, the leaders will rebuke and criticize the followers, their own followers. And they will say, did we prevent you from accepting iman and guidance when it came to you? No, this is not true. We didn't do that. Instead, it is you who disbelieve from your own selves. That kufr and shirk came from your own self, not from us. When the misguided leaders will defend themselves in this manner, the followers will speak again and will explain to them the manner in which they caused them to be misguided. So then the weak ones and the followers will now give a rebuttal. They will now say, you want to know how you misguided us? Then they will say, the Quran says, those who were deemed weak will say to those who are arrogant, that's the leaders, nay, but it was your plotting by night and day when you ordered us to disbelieve in Allah and set up rivals to him. This is how you misguided us. Night and day you were ordering us to do this. You threatened us to do this. We were poor, we obeyed you, we couldn't oppose you. So you were telling us to do this and that and making false promises to us. So this is how we listened to you and we became misguided. So you are the ones who misguided us. And that will be, you know, the, the, the debate that will be happening between the followers and the followed ones on the day of judgment. With that, we'll stop there. Inshallah, we'll continue next day. كل يوم على بعضها ليه دنيا الناس بتنسى يوم رجعها لربها ليه ضيع بينا الأمان والأمين نفتكره خان